Reverend, would you look at uh, Romans chapter 8 uh, in the Bible? It's page 982 in that Revised Standard Version. And would you look at that verse 1, Romans 8 and verse 1? And you see the way it reads there. Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm concerned that each one of you would know what that means. That's really uh, the heart of everything that we do here on Sunday mornings. I'm concerned that you'd know what that means because it seems to me our present society has all kinds of versions of Christianity around and you're facing it and I'm facing it. And we have all kinds of strange ideas of what it is to be in Christ Jesus. And it's very important that we know what it really means. And loved ones, that whole chapter there actually explains it. And if you read it in Greek, you would see that there's very little break between that verse 1 and, for instance, verse 5. In fact, the Greek actually runs right on. It runs like this. You'd read verse 1 first, and then you'd hop right to verse 5, you see. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. In other words, a person in Christ Jesus sets their minds on the things of the Spirit, and those who aren't in Christ Jesus set their minds on the things of the flesh. And actually that determines whether you're in Christ Jesus or not. It's not whether you were confirmed in the Lutheran Church or became a member of the Methodist Church or were baptized in the Catholic Church. It doesn't even matter if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God or that he died for your sins. What does matter is if you walk after the Spirit and set your minds on the things of the Spirit rather than on the things of the flesh. And that's what determines where you are. And brothers and sisters, to tell you the truth, that's the whole point of it all. I mean, what does it matter if it doesn't have anything to do with your everyday life? Who wants some, what Wesley said, you know, faith is not a speculative, rational thing, a cold, lifeless ascent, a train of ideas in the head, but it is a disposition of the heart. And who of us wants some speculative, rational thing, or some train of ideas in the head, or something that we hope we'll be able to spit out at a priest or a minister just before we die? That isn't Christianity. That isn't being in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ Jesus is something to do with everyday life. And I'd love you to know that, you know, and to know what that is. And here's where my heart and my head feels for you, because when you go on to, you know, it's pretty strong that in verse 6, you see, verse 6 of Romans 8, to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And my heart goes out to you because I know some of you, some of you I don't know, but some of you I do know, and I think a number of you have little idea of what that means, you know. You, you want to know, and you say to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. <gasps> yeah, yeah, well, and we're all mixed up in it, you know. Set on the mind on the flesh, all we men, I don't know who the latest beauty is in the movies, but you know, you think, oh yeah, I shouldn't set my mind on flesh, you know, sex or anything like that, that's death. And set my mind on the spirit, yeah, that's thinking of God and thinking of church. And we have all kinds of strange ideas of what to set the mind on the spirit means and to set the mind on the flesh means. And so that's what I'd like to try to share with you today and if God guides us, you know, in the next few Sundays. What is it to live in the Spirit? What does it mean, this business of living in the Spirit? We need to start right back in a very uh, basic uh, truth. That is the truth of why God made you and me, why God made us. And you find it back there in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3. 
1 John chapter 1 and verse 3. And you see it on page 1065, page 1065, 1 John and chapter 1 and verse 3. This is why God made us, why he made you. 1 John 1 and verse 3, you see the top left-hand corner of page 1065. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's why God made you. God made you to have fellowship with him. And I hope you don't go to sleep at that and think, oh yeah, that means I'll be walking around his throne with candles and all kinds of things in my hands. No, no, fellowship is friendship. Friendship, that's the dearest thing in this world. You know it is. You know it is beautiful, the friendships that you have. That's about all you've got. Because all the money goes, all the businesses go, all the professions die, but you've got friendship. Friendship is the dearest thing that we have in this world. And it's the dearest thing in the universe. God made you and me to be his friends. And loved ones, you have to cast out of your mind all silly ideas of God, you know. You have all kinds of wild ideas of him as a kind of holy, holy person who doesn't know you at all. He is the dearest guy in the whole universe. He knows you better than your mom knows you. He knows you better than your best pal in the bar knows you. He knows your worst parts. He bore them in himself on Calvary. He knows you, you see. And yet he still loves you. I mean, that's the amazing thing. I mean, all the rest of us can love you because we don't know you so well. But he loves you even though he knows you with his whole heart. He knows every bit of you. And he loves you still. See, our dear father made you to have fellowship with himself, to be his friend. That's what will go on and on forever. I don't know if you've ever thought of eternity. But, I mean, it's all right saying, oh, I'm looking forward to eternity. Oh, it'll be great when we're there. But really, in certain moments, if you can conceive of infinity and thank God, God, and I say that really, we can't too often conceive of infinity. If you ever do conceive of infinity, have you ever been frightened by it and terrified by it? It's terrible. I mean, in one way, to think of this going on and on forever and ever is terrible. Except if it's a friend that we can trust. If it's a dear friend that we can trust. Friendship is the only thing that could go on forever and ever and never bore you into hell, you see. So it's friendship and fellowship that is the purpose that we're made for. Now, that's why God made us with the same capacities as he has himself. Now, you can see the reason for that. You, uh, uh, if you have, I once had a little dog who was very dear to me, a little Yorkshire Terrier, but you know I've joked about it before. He's okay when it's throwing a ball, you know, and catching it and bringing it back and letting me tickle his tummy and all that kind of thing. He's great on that. He's hopeless on appreciating Chopin or Beethoven. He's terrible on discussing predestination or the political situation. In other words, you can't have much friendship with something that hasn't the capacity that you have. And so that's why God made us with the same capacities as he has. That's why, you remember, way back in Genesis, that's why he said uh, to Jesus what he did say. You see, back in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, and verse 26. And it's interesting, you know, to see that God was talking to somebody when he said that. And of course it was Jesus, because Jesus was with him before the earth was made. Genesis 1 and 26. Then God said, let us, Lord Jesus, Jesus, my son, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's what that means, you see. You and I were made in the image of God. We were made like God. We have capacities like God. We have the same capacities as he has. Now, you can find the details of that if you go over to Genesis 2 there and verse 7. Genesis 2 and verse 7, and I'll try to 
make some of this as clear as I can as we go along. But some of you will know some of the words without me even helping, but maybe it'll help those who don't. Genesis 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. And dust is, uh, it's a long time from I've uh, uh, written the, uh, the, uh, the Hebrew, but dust is afar. And Adama is like that. It really turns out to be the word for, I'm sorry, it turns out to be the word for, um, for Adam. This word, Adama, it means the ground. God took dust from the ground and breathed into it his nostrils the breath of life. And the Hebrew word for, for, for uh, breath is actually ruach. It is like that in, I'm sorry, I'm transliterated, it's like that, ruach. And it's the word that means breath or spirit. So it's a word that means either breath or spirit. You remember when Jesus said, the spirit bloweth where, the wind bloweth where it listeth? So the spirit is. It's because of the similarity between wind and spirit, or spirit and breath, that he used that analogy. So God breathed into the ground that he took, his own spirit, and man became a living being. And actually, you remember the word in, uh, in the King James Version is the word nephesh, and that is soul. And so you have man with a soul, a spirit, and of course the ground was the body. And those are the three capacities that God himself has. And the Father made us with those capacities. Now, he didn't make us like himself. He made us with the same capacities as he has, but he didn't make us filled with his own life. That he gave us free will to receive or reject. Do you see that? So, I mean, you can have a, a body and a spirit and a soul, but they're filled with a hateful, angry kind of life. And, of course, you can have no friendship with them. But if you have a soul, a spirit, and a body filled with the same kind of spirit, as another person, then you can have fellowship. Now that God gave us a choice about. And you'll see it there in Genesis chapter 2, and it's verse 16. Genesis 2 and 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So God gave us free will. And he said, now I've given you these capacities. You've got those whether you like it or not. But you have a choice of eating of the trees of the garden that I have put there for you, or you can refuse to eat of them if you want. And particularly, he said, there are two trees in the middle of the garden. And you see that in Genesis 2 and verse 9. Genesis 2 and 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So you see God put two trees in the middle of the garden, one a tree of life, one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, loved ones, the tree of life was later expressed as Jesus. The tree of life is God's own spirit. It's the thing that makes him work. It's the, make, the thing that makes him live. It's the thing that makes him him. It's his whole spirit. You know the way you talk about, oh, that person is a great spirit. Well, you know what you mean. You mean, oh, their whole attitude to life is just good. It's a whole attitude. Or we say, oh, I wish I had my dad's spirit. Or I wish I had my mom's spirit. And what we mean is, we wish we had their whole attitude to life, their whole way they respond to things. Now, that's what God made available to us in the tree of life. At times now, we call it the Holy Spirit. But really, it's just God's own spirit, the life that runs through him. 
And God said, now you can eat of that tree. Actually, that's what I'd like you to do. But you've got free will. I don't want a bundle of prisoners in heaven with me. You've got free will. You've got the capacity to have fellowship with me. You can eat of this tree and you can become like me and we can live together forever. Or there is another way to go. And I want you to know I'm making it available because I don't want robots. There is a tree of knowledge of good and evil and you can eat of that if you want. But that will eventually bring you to death. Now, loved ones, that's the way the Father made things at the beginning. There's another way to put all that, if it helps you. In 1 Thessalonians, I think it is, and chapter 5 and verse 23, you'll see it all expressed in a way more clearly. It's page 1031. 1,031. You see it there at the bottom right-hand corner. Well, it's in the middle of the page, really. But it's near the end of that column. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, page 1,031. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. And sometimes it can be drawn like this. Sometimes you can think of your spirit as being the innermost part of you. The part of you that can actually communicate with God. And then your soul, you can think of, and will, if God continues to guide us this way, we'll go into the details of what the soul is in later Sundays. But the soul is like an overcoat around your spirit. Your soul, actually, some of you will guess, if you see the Greek is suke, and it looks like that transliterated. And of course, you can see the connection that psyche has with psychology. It's actually the psychological part of you, the soul. And round that is your body. And so God has made us with virtually three layers, like himself in that way. And his will was that we would work in fellowship with him. And we would live off his love. And we would receive from him his spirit. And that would fill us with his life. And we would fill the world with that life. And that's what he meant when he asked us to eat of the tree of life. I can put it in more down-to-earth terms. When Adam was in the Garden of Eden, God's will was this. Adam, there's an orange tree over there. You need some orange juice this morning? Go and get some orange juice. That was the Father's plan. That through his friendship with Adam, Adam would know what God was thinking. And God would meet all Adam's needs through his directing Adam how to develop the world. In that way, the seagulls on the Santa Barbara coast would never have died from the oil and tar that we produced through our oil spills. Because it was the Father's will that he would direct us where to get the oil, how to develop the world's resources. It was the Father's will that we would work in love with him and receive directions from him. And he would provide us our security as we lived in friendship with him. In that way, our jobs we would do because God was guiding us to do them, not because they give us security, because we would get our security through him and from him, and he would add all other things onto us. It was the same with his love for us. It was his will that each one of you would know him intimately, and you would know that he knew your name, and you'd be like friends. You'd just walk with God. You remember like Enoch. In fact, it was the Lord's will that we would be like Enoch. He was not, for God took him, that we would never die. 
that we would just be close in relationship with the Father and would just lift off this earth whenever he decided it was time for us to join him in the other place. So it was the Father's will that we would know that he loved us and then if the one significant other in the whole universe loved us, what does it matter about anybody else? That would be the end of problems with self-esteem, problems with self-worth, problems with loneliness, problems with feeling nobody appreciated us. Because it was God's will that we would live off his love. And in that, we would find our security coming from him, our sense of significance coming from him. It was also his will that we would walk through this world with the owner of the world beside us. That we would water ski in Hawaii with the owner of the waves right beside us that we would ski on the snow slo slopes in Colorado with the father of those slopes right beside us. It was his will that we would get our happiness from walking in communion with him as friend with friend. And therefore that there would never be this desperate desire, we have to get happiness, we have to get happiness, because we'd have happiness with him. So that was his will, loved ones, that in friendship with him, we would get all the sense of security that we needed because that's what love gives you, you know that. And all the sense of significance or importance that we needed, because that's what somebody who loves you does for you. And all the sense of happiness, because you know if you've had a dear friendship or a dear loved one whom you cared about, you didn't need anything else. You had all the happiness you needed with them. That was the Father's will. Now, loved ones, what happened? We men and women decided we will get what we need from the world ourselves. We will get this by our own knowledge of good and evil. Adam, why listen to him telling you about getting juice from the tree? You know that you got juice from that tree last year. Why not note that down in a book and we'll establish a knowledge of good and evil. It is good to get juice from this tree. It is evil to get it from that tree. Let us set up a whole series of laws and precedents that will enable us to use this world to get what we need from it. And we will live by our own knowledge of good and evil. And so we determined, you remember, to do this by our own power and our own strength. And you see it there, loved ones, if you look at the account of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, you see how it came about. The very words that actually Satan used are some of those words that we have used. It's uh, page 2 there in Genesis 3 and verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. That is, I can get my security from this knowledge of good and evil. I can know how to play the securities. I can know how to play the stock market. I can know how to do my job better than everybody else so that I scramble to the top of the heap and get a better salary. I can get food from this if I use my head and avoid what is evil and get what human beings say is good. And that it was a delight to the eyes. I can get happiness from myself. I can buy a boat with this money. I can buy a motorbike with this money. I can buy a nice house. I can get happiness with these things. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. I can get power using my mind to control other people. Through my knowledge, I can gain significance and importance and influence for myself. And loved ones, what we did was we turned away from God himself and we turned to the world. And we began to use the world and the love that the world would give us to try to enable us to live in this world the way God wanted us to. In other words, we were still aiming at being in his image. We still wanted to be God, but we wanted to take his place. We didn't want to be his children in love with him. We wanted to be God. We wanted to control things. And in actual fact, you know what has happened because we had to go to the world for our security, so we came under the domination of things. And you know how we're trying to get the security from the number of things that we can amass. And of course, we turn to people for our sense of importance and significance, and with four billion others trying to do the same thing, there isn't much significance to go around, four billion of us. So there are many of us with troubles with self-esteem, naturally. 
but we go to people for that. And then, of course, you know the domination we come under with circumstances because we're always trying to make our circumstances right so that we can get some kind of happiness for ourselves. <clears throat> Loved ones, that's how we came into our present state. Now, if you say, what has this to do, brother, with spirit and flesh? This is living by the spirit. See? Living down that way. This is living by the flesh. It doesn't need to be sexy at all. It's just this. That's living by the flesh. Living by the flesh is depending on that old world there for the love, for the security and the significance and happiness that God intends us to get from himself. And those who live according to the flesh will die and you will. Because a terrible thing, and I'll try to share it with you next day, a terrible thing has happened to this part of us when we decided to depend on the world. So as you go through this coming week, ask the Holy Spirit to show you how you yourself are living. Because loved ones, being in Jesus is a very practical, everyday choice that you make moment by moment. And you're making it even this afternoon, you know. And the, the interesting thing is, it's not what you do. It's not what you do. It's why you do it and the attitude with which you do it. You can see that. We can all go to Hawaii. We can all have wonderful holidays everywhere if we have the attitude to God that is right and receive it as from him. But if there is in us that old iron in our soul that is trying to grab what we want and we're doing it with that spirit, then that brings death to us. So do ask the Holy Spirit, you know, to give you light this coming week so that you will actually live in Christ during this coming week. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you that being in Christ is something practical and real. And Father, walking in the Spirit is something that is understandable. And walking in the flesh is something that we can know and that we can reject. But dear Father, we know that we can do nothing unless through your Holy Spirit and through our friendship with you, you begin to give us light about these things. So we ask, Lord, that you'll help us and help the others in this room to know and understand in the Spirit what these things mean for each of us. And Father, we thank you for your plan. We thank you that you do want to be our friend. We thank you, Lord, that that's why you cherish us and that you will miss us badly if we fail to come into heaven and to live with you forever. So, Father, we bow before you now, and we are amazed, Lord, that you would be interested in us as friends. But, Father, we thank you for it, and we give ourselves to you for this coming week to be a friend to you and to begin to regard you as our friend and as our dear Father. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>